Good morning, everyone. We, the Juan Fellows, in partnership with Science and Society, would like to warmly welcome you to our 2019 Symposium on Artificial Intelligence and Society, or SOS ai -ity, as we like to say. <laughs> the Huang Fellows Program trains students to understand science in the context of and in service to society. As Fellows, we seek to learn how to integrate ethics, policy, and social implications into our scientific research. This is our second annual spring symposium, and in accordance with our mission to bridge the gap between science and society, today we will foster an engaging discussion regarding the question of artificial intelligence and its relation to a host of societal and ethical questions. Our panels today include medicine from 9.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m., the military from 11 to 12, and economics from 2 to 3 p.m. At 12.30 p.m., our keynote speaker, Douglas Rushkoff, the author of Team Human, will discuss human autonomy in the digital age. We are very happy to have you, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Reagan Portalance, who will moderate our first panel, AI and Medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Pinky. Okay, so if we could just start off going down the line, each of you could introduce yourselves and describe what uh, fields you work in and how it relates to our theme today. Ryan Shaw. I'm a, um, a um, associate um, a professor here at Duke. I'm the um, faculty director of the Duke um, a Mobile App Gateway, which is really the um, health systems, um, a digital health um, 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 translational um, um, uh, um, group where we are um, actively um, implementing, uh, implementing um, digital health tools into the Duke um, health system. And I'm also a, a, I'm a um, researcher uh, too. I'm um, funded by the, by the um, National Science Foundation and the, and the um, NIH um, um, uh, too. So um, uh, my work in this area um, is very, um, it's very um, applied where we enroll real um, patients and we are um, seeking to understand how to detect um, signal from uh, from really um, streaming um, data from uh, from um, a patients, and these could be um, wearable devices. It might be um, apps. It could be um, sensors that we put in their in their um, home, or even in or even in um, <coughs> even in um, a Duke Hospital too. So, sorry, so. so I'll take that since I know it works. <laughs> Hi, I'm Artie Rye. I am a professor at Duke Law School, and I co-direct the Duke. Uh, Center for Innovation Policy at Duke Law. So my work right now is focused on a grant that I am working on with the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy that looks at mostly FDA approved AI enabled uh, devices. And I would say even more specifically data um, data-based machine learning devices. So if we're gonna get more narrow and, and focused in terms of what, what I'm looking at, uh, it's, there are about a dozen that have been approved thus far and they're very interesting in terms of the sophistication, some are quite sophisticated, some less so, um, and s some people would suggest that, have suggested that the FDA is perhaps being too lax. Other people have suggested that, that the FDA is is just right. I don't think anyone has suggested that they're going too slowly, but but we can talk about that. In any event, so we're looking at, at that, those particular machine learning enabled devices through the lens of my focus, which is intellectual property, and in particular looking at questions of whether you want to call it interpretability or explainability, the legal regime, the 21st Century Cures Act, which is the relevant legal regime, draws a line that is essentially based on interpretability or explainability. It draws a line that says the FDA regulates if the, the model is not independently reviewable by the physician. So it's a very important line for purposes of the law. And it's also an important line for purposes of my interest in intellectual property because 
the questions of patents and trade secrecy are very relevant to interoperability and explainability in particular with respect to training data, which is the new, new oil, if, if you want to call it that. Um, and and uh, so as a consequence, we are focusing a lot on training data. I look forward to this. <laughs> <coughs> okay, I'll try this one and see if it works. Uh, can we hear me? Yes, maybe. Should I try the other one? It should be hot. Should be hot? Okay, well, Double check I'll just speak loudly and hope it works. Um, yep, cool. Okay. Uh, so I'm honored to be here with Ryan and Arty. Um, it uh, is, I think, um, an important area that the undergrads uh, should sort of pay attention to is, is machine learning, and I'm particularly interested in the applications of machine learning in medicine. So I'm Neil Gallagher, by the way, um, to introduce myself. I'm a fourth year graduate student in um, neurobiology, and I study how to use uh, machine learning models to understand uh, mental health issues and psychiatric disorders. Um, so as an example, I uh, recently worked on a project that found a uh, biomarker for depression-like behavior in mice, um, and we work with mice rather than humans because it's more ethical to um, you know, get a lot of mice and do things to them so that we can implant uh, wires in their brains and record brain activity. Um, so this project found a pattern of brain activity that would have been too complex for any human to just kind of recognize by eye from the data. Um, and it was relatively easy to pull out using machine learning models, and I think that's kind of the power of machine learning models. Um, and it turns out that the biomarker that we found was present even before the mice started to show that depressive-like behavior. So before they were exposed to whatever stress got them in that depressive-like state. Um, and we're hoping that we can kind of translate this technology to humans uh, where we might be able to identify people who are likely to develop depression before they start to show those symptoms. Um, so that's sort of an area that I've been working on recently that um, I hope can give you guys an idea of one, what you can do uh, with machine learning and medicine, at least in the uh, mental health regime, um, and also give you sort of a background about me. Okay, thank you. Um, so I believe that one of the common themes when it comes to AI is trying to strike a balance. And so if each of you could sort of talk about the balance within your work, maybe starting with Mr. Gallagher. I know that a lot of the models that you work with, there's sort of a contrast between the interpretability of them and how accurately they model the brain. So if you could sort of talk about how you find the balance between those two things. Yeah. Um, so when I think about uh, developing models that are interpretable, um, and I think this is an area that you might be quite interested in as well, so if you want to jump in at any point, feel free. Um, I, I think that there's maybe uh, two properties of models that I'm interested in when it comes to interpretability. The first being simplicity, and the second one being relevance. Um, so simple models generally don't have a lot of moving parts. I think we all have a good idea for what uh, simplicity might mean in a general context, at least. Um, and so it's easy, easy to wrap your head around them. Um, and as an example of a simple model that is somewhat appropriate to medicine, you can think of body mass index. So body mass index is made up of two components, your height and your weight. Um, and people often use it as a model of body fat content. Um, and you know, it's a very simple model. There's only really two components to it, and it's pretty, it's not, there's not that much going on there. It's just simple division. Um, but it's also somewhat relevant um, in that we know that weight is a relevant um, sort of variable that's associated with body fat content, but I wouldn't call it the most relevant variable. Um, and I think, you know, it's a very simple model that could work on relevance that might help its interpretability. Um, I would say maybe the most relevant model for body fat content might be some kind of a map where you're, you know, where you basically have a map over your entire body of the amount of, you know, maybe the, uh, an index of body fat at that particular point in the body. Something like that where it's exactly pinpointing the variables that you're looking at rather than getting something that's sort of an indirect measurement of the variable you really want. Um, and so uh, many people who work on quantitative models, always, they tend to have a good grasp um, on simplicity, how to make a model more simple. And most of the time, it's understood that if you make your model too simple, you have this trade-off, like you were talking about, 
where a model that's too simple will not be accurate, or it just won't do it, it won't be high quality and it won't actually do a good job describing the thing you want to describe. Um, and that's true for me as well in all the models I work with. There's always sort of a, uh, a happy medium for the amount of simplicity that you want. Um, but something that I really try to focus on that I think um, a lot of machine learning researchers kind of miss on is that uh, relevance portion, where a more relevant model will both increase your interpretability, but it'll also actually increase your accuracy. So one of the things that I focus on is building models that are specifically more relevant to the domain that I'm working in. It takes more work um, because you need to have domain expertise in the exact problem that you want, while simultaneously also having expertise in building the models in the first place. Um, but it works, um, and you know, as an example, the, the project I was talking about before, um, it was not very simple, it was very complex. Uh, essentially, the model produced a map of many brain regions, and that map shows connections between brain regions, and there were a bunch of connections, um, and each connection sort of represented a different type of communication between brain regions. Um, and the, uh, again, this model had a high level of complexity, but I would call it relatively interpretable because I could hand it off to a neuroscientist and they knew what to do about it because those brain regions and the type of communication was very relevant to them and relevant to the problem. Um, so I think it doesn't have to be a trade-off if you focus on relevance more than you do simplicity. Awesome. And so, um, as you mentioned but in during your introduction, Dr. Rai, you also do a lot with interpretability of data, but more in terms of how it contrasts with protecting trade secrets. And so based on your experience, uh, how important is interpretability when it comes to clinical trials? So I'm going to focus on, on clinical uh, uh, medicine as opposed to trials. So, so it, it, it's a great question. And so interpretability for physicians is a question that people have very different opinions about. Some physicians will tell you at the end of the day, we don't really understand how biologics or complex biologics work either, and yet we prescribe them to our patients, so this is not so different. Others, including the American Medical Association, will say, no, it's really important that physicians have some sense of what this machine learning model is doing. And a physician is obviously not the kind of domain expert that a neuroscientist would be nor is she necessarily going to be a data scientist. So that's a really complicated question. And for that reason, I think in part, Congress was actually somewhat prescient, which is hard to believe sometimes, but <laughs> Congress did something, I think, intelligent in the 21st Century Cures Act, which is, as I indicated, it said, if the model is not independently understandable, essentially, by the physician, it has to be go through the FDA. And the FDA gets, and this is how the trade secrecy piece comes in, the FDA gets all the training data, they get the learning algorithm, they get the test data, so the learning algorithm works on the training data to get the model, then it works on the test data to see how, how well it functions, essentially, and then you, the good data scientist will do many iterations of that. So the FDA gets all that. Now that's all trade secret information. And some people would say that's all fine. You know, the FDA is our custodian and we trust the FDA to do the right thing. Others would say, well, not always. So in the clinical trial data context, and this does get to clinical trials, there have been some situations where the FDA has not always done 100% the right thing, not because it was corrupt in some way, but, but just because it too had data either hidden from it or it wasn't completely capable of being on top of everything. So the Vioxx scandal is, is a, you know, the classic example. And, and so one has to think about the extent to which one thinks the FDA is, as the repository of all this trade secret information, is sufficiently trustworthy that nobody else need look at that information. Um, and Dr. Shah, a lot of your work deals with collecting large amounts of patient data through the mobile technologies you were discussing. So how do you balance finding enough data for it to be clinically relevant while also protecting the, the privacy of the patient? 
Yeah, so that's a big, um, it's a big um, challenge right now is um, being able to use these tools to find um, clinically relevant um, signal. And a part of the reason is that real patient data has a lot of um, missing data in it because that just reflects, it just reflects um, real life. And so um, that can make things um, challenging if you're trying to act upon um, health needs within um, real time. And so we really have to learn how to how to um, collapse and how to um, respond to how to um, respond to data at the most appropriate time, um, which may or may not be in um, real time um, as we begin to um, a transition of getting um, health data out of what is what has has um, traditionally been a more um, structured you know um, clinical um, environment where people are you know um, a pro they are um, a professionally trained. To um, collect data and 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 um, so forth to this um, transition where we are now able to get data from many different um, places. It could be from your um, pocket um, on a a a um, watch that you have. It could be at um, home from um, from from um, sensors there, and then that kind of also um, lends itself to um, to um, challenges around um, privacy. Because uh, we are blurring the lines between what is really the um, consumer world and the um, and the um, patient world, um, and in the um, patient world, there are a lot more um, regulations. There, uh, we have to abide by a lot more um, privacy um, standards. But that's not necessarily the same when it comes to the um, consumer world, where you have that um, autonomy to really use um, whatever device um, that you want. You can work with you can work with or you can use devices from um, tech companies and you can prelim and you can um, freely um, give them your um, data uh, such as um, Fitbit or really um, anything else and then uh, it's a really gray um, area right now when that data comes back into a um, health system such as um, Duke where we fall under various 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 um, regulations. Such as such as um, HIPAA, which is the um, Health Information and Patient Portability Act. I hope I got that right. Um, <laughs> I'm sweating over that. Um, and so this is a real it's a real um, challenge right now. Um, and it's going beyond just these um, wearable devices. There's also um, there's also um, genomics based companies. You can send in your um, DNA to say um, 23andMe or um, or you know also um, Ancestry.com. And you supposedly um, consent in um, some way uh, to give this information to these um, companies. They may be able to um, sell it in different ways. You give your data to um, Facebook um, and um, so forth. So it's really um, blurry in, um, in terms of really how we're able to um, really um, um, manage this right now. So speaking more about privacy, since I think that's a very um, hot topic when it comes to artificial intelligence, if the other panels uh, want to chime in about how it can protect it in other aspects of medicine, especially as Dr. Shaw was mentioning, that sometimes it becomes difficult to know how much the patients are consenting to and what data that they understand that they're actually freely giving to a clinician. So I'm happy to put in my two cents. I should say that I'm not a privacy scholar, and, and so my views are probably heterodox um, for the privacy community. In my view, at the end of the day, it, it seems to me that privacy is going to be difficult to maintain. And so what we have to be concerned about as a society is what protections we have at the back end against bad uses of information. And so. I've been very interested in the work that has been done now for a while, sadly it hasn't come to fruition yet, on how to bolster various anti-discrimination law so that we have protection against uh, uh, malicious uses of information. So I, I've not been, uh, at the end of the day, um, convinced that we can at the, maintain privacy against those who would really seek to get particular pieces of information on individuals. Now, why they want to is another question, and in my view, if they do, they should not be able to use it in any um, negative way against the individual. Um, <coughs> on the topic of privacy, I don't 
think I have much to contribute to the conversation beyond sort of just pointing to, uh, you know, public examples of uh, privacy breaches that happen all over the place in what should be um, very sort of high security domains such as uh, financial data getting leaked. It seems like way too frequently. Um, and so if that's a solution, that, or if that's a problem that the financial industry hasn't solved, um, I am pessimistic about uh, how soon it will be solved in medicine either if uh, technology continues to sort of grow in its presence in medicine. Um, so who do you guys believe should be held more responsible with protecting the privacy, whether it's you know, the research side, the law side, or the more consumer side of it? Well, so <laughs> um, I, I would say, you know, probably all of the above, given that the problem is so large. I think that every entity that is a custodian of data should have some responsibility for maintaining security in particular of the data, which, you know, is a huge problem because if, if somebody really wants to hack your data, there's a cat and mouse game that one is always playing. And so, and that's difficult. Um, but yeah, I think everyone in the chain of custody of the data ha has to be responsible. Um, and even then, <laughs> I think that there's going to be, there are going to be breaches. And then we have to be concerned about making sure that those breaches don't end up being used to, to harm the individual whose data was breached. Um, I suppose on the research side, when it comes to traditional research, and maybe not the, you know, it, it sounds like the type of research that, or the data that you work with is not the same as if I have a patient that comes in and lets me collect their data within the same building. Um, in that case, I think we might have the easiest job as researchers because one of the best ways that you can still sort of maintain privacy is air-gapped systems where the data that you're collecting never touches the internet. It never touches a system that's actually connected to you know, something that can get it out. Um, and so we can still do that in traditional research where uh, Dr. Shaw might not have the luxury. Sure. Um, <laughs> so this is a big ongoing, ongoing um, challenge right now. And um, what we find is really um, one of the most um, difficult ones is being able to have um, patients really um, understand what um, privacy means and from really um, diverse patients who may not have real great um, literacy skills, they may not have, um, they may not uh, have great um, technical um, literacy skills, and so when we have them read through um, legalese or through um, consent forms, most people really don't understand that, and it's very um, common, you just, you know, you just um, consent to things, because it's just too complex, and when, and when it's already um, difficult just to understand um, health and how um, healthcare is, is um, delivered, it can almost be really, almost, almost really, um, it's almost um, insurmountable to then also have to understand um, data and how, how, how your um, data is or um, is not um, protected depending on where and how it um, travels. Because when you come into a um, health system, your data is going into a um, electronic health record. And now we're starting to add in these other kinds of um, data too. And so, uh, there is a lot of work um, going on now on how do we um, how do we um, simplify this for for um, uh, patients where it's hard for um, clinicians as it is to really um, understand all of this as it is. Um. Uh, so as the artificial intelligence algorithms continue to improve over the years, do you think that it's possible to use these models to accurately fit data to an individual, or will they always sort of be restricted to the general trends of a population as a whole? Me? Okay. Um, so, in a sense, I you I don't think you'll ever reach you'll ever have algorithms that reach perfect ability to see a, an individual, a new individual, and say I know exactly what's going on here. Um, as in my experience, all of these machine learning algorithms are only as good as the data, the historical data that you fed into them. So if you feed them in data that deals with all sorts of you know, disorders and diseases, but um, then you get a patient in with some completely new uh, disorder, the algorithm's just gonna fail miserably. Um, and now, 
I don't know if that's necessary. If the skill set there is much worse than most doctors, to be honest, where if you give most doctors a patient who is just a completely new case that's never been seen before, they'll throw their hands up in the air. Now there are two sort of caveats here. One is, you know, if if you have someone who's got this really rare disease, if you bring them somewhere like Duke Hospital, you have the best doctors in the world who can kind of come look at the patient and actually study them and use their intuition to try and actually solve the case. Um, we don't have machine learning algorithms that can do that yet. The other caveat is a doctor will tell you, I don't know what's going on here. Um, we're still working on, the, uh, it's an open field in terms of getting machine learning algorithms to actually tell you, I don't know what I'm doing versus like I'm very confident. Um, it's definitely something that may, might be solved in easier cases, but when it gets that difficult, I don't know if that's a solved problem. Sure. Um, I'll take a slightly, a slightly um, different um, approach to this because I would say um, yes. Um, it and um, AI, depending on what you mean by that, is just um, one set of really uh, many um, different tools to be able to um, analyze da data, uh, which we've been, which we we um, currently do. Um, and so, if we think about taking a patient's a patient's um, EKG, their their you know um, heart rhythm, we do have tools that are able to detect to are able to detect um, signal in that. We use them um, all the time. Um, it's more that we're now able to get that same data from more people and really potentially in um, real time across the care continuum. So not just within the uh, you know um, hospital but after they get after they get um, discharged home and when they um, come back in and so it really depends on the um, question and really what the type of you know um, data is because in that case we can detect a um, signal from a um, individual and we could do it from a population, um, but it really comes down to the type of um, data that you are um, looking at. So um, it depends. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I'd say. So I, I don't want to preempt a question you may ask down the line, but. I think we've all kind of emphasized the importance of the training data, and, and so if the training data is not going to give you the information that you would need for a, a particular patient, um, then the algorithm is not going to give you that either. Um, so speaking of that more on the training data that we give to the algorithms, how do we avoid having bias from that data? So I'll speak a little bit to that because I think that this is where perhaps the FDA has not done as good a job of ensuring that the training data is as representative as it should be. And so my understanding of the current state of the art is that especially with respect to demographic variability, one really needs representative data, that one cannot just generate that um, through, through mechanisms that don't involve real data. Um, now there are all sorts of mechanisms that people are mooting GANs and the like uh, for purposes of generating data, but I think that right now we need the real data. And that's a, that's a challenge um, because this is where there is a lot of proprietary interest. and. The um, Memorial Sloan Kettering, for example, has gotten into all sorts of scandals already because it has some very valuable cancer data and it's trying to monetize it in all sorts of ways. And that, since um, your fellows who are interested in ethics talk about conflicts of interest that could be created, um, you know, and I'm putting even aside the question of whether anyone owns data um, because that's a whole another set of questions that one can get into, but I don't want to unless you want to. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so I think touching on, on the data a bit more, um, from my perspective, it's very hard to do a great job balancing your data. And I guess um, this, this builds on what you were saying, but when you're balancing your data, <clears throat> you know, as an example, if you wanted to build a machine learning algorithm to decide, you know, you have a uh, job applicant and you have to decide what salary you want to give them. If you just use historical data, I could almost guarantee that that historical data would have a gender bias that we don't want, but the gender bias would be there where women have been paid less than men for 
essentially the same job. And if you look at, and if you just give that data to an algorithm and don't do anything about it, the algorithm will take two equally qualified people, one being a man and one being a woman, and it will probably learn to say the woman should get paid less just looking at the data. And that's not good, and we need to fix that. Um, it's an active area of research for how to fix that. One, I think, is what you were mentioning, is where you can sort of more carefully curate the data or try to get a more representative batch of data from a population that you think is balanced the way it should be. Um, there are other active areas of research which can go beyond that, but uh, which are questionable. So a colleague of mine is working on um, a method where you can essentially have a, tell a, an algorithm to be blind to a particular characteristic, um, but in order to get that to work, you also need to get it to be blind to all of the characteristics that are correlated with that one. Um, so for instance, if you, know, you want an algorithm to, uh, I'm trying to come up with something off the top of my head. Let's say you're still doing the salary example, um, but you know, for some reason, let's say it's for a sports team and height is also a characteristic because height is correlated with, uh, with biological sex, then you also need to tell the algorithm to ignore height and to ignore other things, and that just gets very messy, so it's still active in terms of what we're trying to do. So um, I'll just add to how do you reduce um, bias in this, and a big um, challenge right now is that there really aren't great um, standards right now in terms of how and the type of, of um, data you collect within um, clinical Care. And what I mean by this is that it's um, different by every um, institution. Uh, for example, even though both Duke and um, UNC have the same uh, larger, larger um, electronic um, health record company called um, Epic, and there's also um, Cerner among, among um, others too, um, we don't collect data the um, same way. It's not structured the same way. And so this makes it really um, challenging to merge um, to merge um, data sets and to get larger data sets among a larger um, a population where you can imagine um, a patients here go to both um, health systems. They also go to go to go to um, go to um, Wake Med. And so this is a really big um, limitation, and it puts a lot of noise into the data, and it and it does make it more um, challenging to detect um, the signal. You each already touched on this a little bit, but what do you see as the greatest obstacles to the development of artificial intelligence for the purpose of like, the clinical perspective of it? Uh, so we, <laughs> we've touched on uh, training data and interoperability and bias and privacy and security and, and uh, trade secrecy, uh, but I actually don't know that any of those is necessarily the biggest obstacle at the end of the day. My concern is that there will be some, and there to some extent has been <laughs> with IBM Watson, a set of really high profile failures. And even though the number of people impacted at the end of the day will not be necessarily as significant as the number of people who die every year from medical errors of the most ordinary common sort. Nonetheless, the way that risk is perceived by the general public is such that this will be seen as imposing huge risks upon the general public. Um, all right, I'll, I'll go first. Um, in So in my experience, I think the reason that I've been able to sort of um, do what I've been able to do is because I have a unique training background where I have, um, I've already been trained in engineering and machine learning, and now I'm doing a PhD in neurobiology. Um, I think that's uh, something that there needs to be more of, um, and at least in my particular field, but I think more broadly, uh, the biggest obstacle that I see is you don't really get people who have strong training in both areas mm -hmm. of sort of quantitative modeling and machine learning and medicine, or at least particular medical fields. Um, and I think you can get sort of collaboration where you have one person who's an expert in one and one person who's an expert in the other. Um, and that can work for some things, but I think there's always sort of a little bit of information that's lost in translation there. Um, and to get the best chance of success and sort of the most effective models, you need people who are trained in both. 
Yeah, that's going to be a big um, challenge at moving them forward because uh, you, you just can't have people be trained in everything, right? And so, yeah, um, yeah so I, we don't really know how to integrate um, AI and really um, a lot of these tools into into um, a practice yet. And there are many um, reasons why. It could be because of um, a payment of models. It could be of, you know, um, workflow. Um, and uh, so we also need to make sure that to recognize that these are just tools to hopefully enhance clinical decision making um, or to be able to do a, do um, a pattern, pattern recognition to maybe have um, early, um, de early um, detection of a, of a, of a, of a um, change within someone's <coughs> health status. And so um, we have a long ways to go and uh, we're not 100% sure how to put this into practice because there is potentially going to be um, error. Uh, there could be um, problems that arise. There may be misdiagnoses. The um, data may not be of high um, quality. It could be um, um, missing. So uh, we just have to take a um, a measured approach to this, which, for better or for worse, might also um, slow down um, innovation. Um, you know, um, in this area, but we do have to make sure that you know we aren't increasing. We are increasing the um, benefit versus the versus the um, harm. So. so, given all the things that you guys have been discussing about drawbacks of AI, do you think that we'll ever reach the point where an artificial intelligence ag algorithm can actually replace a human physician? Uh, uh, so it's hard to predict um, way down the road, uh, but I would say no, and here's the reason why. What I think AI will do is they will hopefully shift um, clinicians away from being such data managers and be able to more focus on um, people, where we use AI as a um, tool to be able to better to um, deliver care because there are um, some things that we know um, AI at least in its um, current form can't do. It really can assess what are the patient's um, values, what are their family um, dynamics, what are their um, choices, and so um, that really is a um, human-centered um, thing and that is really what um, healthcare is about. So I don't think it will um, currently ever completely um, replace people. Hopefully it will be able to allow us to deliver um, a better care and also um, safer care. Yeah, I agree uh, with Dr. Shaw that it can't, I don't think it'll ever replace people, but it will at certain <coughs> decision points in the, the course of medical care perhaps be uh, an alternative to a practicing physician. So for example, um, there's a a tool that's been approved by the FDA called IDXDR, which is for diabetic retinopathy. And in that case, a general physician, a general internist, is essentially relying upon the machine learning's output to determine whether to refer to a specialist or not. So that's a sort of node replacement, um, which I think at the end of the day probably is a good thing. Um, you know, whether the, I, and I think in that case, actually, there was probably enough training data. Um, but I agree with, uh, with Dr. Shaw that in general, there'll probably have to be a human at some point in the, in the decision making um, for uh, anything that's particularly significant. Um, so on the technology side, I would say, uh, I agree with sort of uh, both of your comments that the human-centered aspect of medicine will not be replaced by uh, machines. I think a lot of sort of the diagnosis and a lot of the things where, you know, there's complex data that's required to make a decision, those are the things that we know that at least traditionally machine learning algorithms are good at. Um, and so I think the technology at some point will be there to replace at least the majority of those aspects. Um, stepping outside of maybe my area of expertise, whether or not that'll actually happen is an entirely different question, I think. Um, you can look at the example of self-driving cars now that sort of, there's been a lot of backlash whenever there is an accident. Um, and it's, it's uncertain whether or not the rate of accidents would, if the rate of accidents would decrease with self-driving cars, I'm not sure that people would still accept them because every once in a while you probably still will get a catastrophic crash. But in the case of people causing the catastrophic crash, you can say, 
oh, it was that one person who was drunk driving, we take them out of the system, we take away their license, and the problem's fixed. Um, you can't really do that with machine learning algorithms because it's the one algorithm that's running probably everything. Um, and so whether or not we're right to say taking that one drunk driver out of the system fixes the whole thing is correct is a different question. Um, but I think people will react to it and say we solved the problem, whereas there's no way to say we solved the problem after a cra catastrophic failure of a machine learning algorithm. And so we've discussed a lot about the risks of artificial intelligence and the possibility of catastrophic failures, and you brought up the idea of self-driving cars. And I know the one thing that people talk about a lot with that is sort of who would be held responsible in the case of a crash. And I feel like that comes into play when it comes to medicine, where there are sort of protocols in place to keep to protect both the patients and also the physicians from human error. So when it comes to using machine learning algorithms, how do we put in the same sort of uh, protections for not only for the patients in case the algorithm makes a mistake, but also how is it possible to hold the algorithm accountable? Well, that uh, sounds like a legal question, so I'll jump in a little bit. Um, so the algorithm per se is not going to be accountable, or the model per se is not going to be accountable, but entities in the system that were responsible for developing and distributing and using the algorithm certainly will be. And that is a classic tort liability question that um, we've struggled with in the context of lots of different products that are put out there. Now, one of the challenges in software historically has been uh, that for not machine learning uh, model software, but in general software, has been that it's sometimes considered a service rather than a product, and this gets into some geeky legal distinctions that are made between services and products with respect to who is liable when and where. But um, that will be a challenge, I think. And for better or for worse, right now, the software, the number of cases, because I have a student who's looking into this right now, um, the number of cases involving software and that service product distinction is not huge. So even with respect to garden variety software, we don't have a lot of good case law. Um, and so that this will be a, a, a learning challenge for the legal system in addition to being a learning challenge for many other systems. Um, I think so at least uh, nominally, a lot of machine learning algorithms that you would want to implement, before you implement them, you should have a good idea of what the failure rate is. And I think that's something that should be doable. Um, and at that point, I guess it becomes, the, I think the decision or the, the blame should ultimately fall on the people who, one, came up with that error rate, and if it was wrong, that's a problem, and two, the people who decided whether or not the error rate was acceptable. Um, I might. Uh, bounce back to Dr. Rye again. Do you know how that's dealt with in sort of medical devices in general? Because I'm not familiar, but I know it must be an issue. Yeah, it's a fascinating question. So with respect to, in a, in a controversial question I should add, um, with respect to um, medical devices that are approved via the pre-market approval process that the FDA has put into place, there's actually a preemption of not there's some fine points one can put around the margins of that claim that there's preemption of tort liability, but in significant part there is preemption because the idea is that the FDA has looked at the risk-benefit calculus in a very comprehensive way and a, a jury in Topeka, Kansas is not gonna do better than the FDA, or so that would be a crude way of putting it. Um, but with respect to, there are very few devices that go through PMA, only about two to three percent. So with respect to all the other devices that go through so-called 510K or even less um, rigorous review than, review than that, um, <laughs> it is a, a question that, you know, uh, so the, the adopter of the device can be held liable. The the creator of the device can be held liable. One can get many different defendants. Um, and as a plaintiff's attorney, presumably one would try to get everyone one could possibly get, and the doctor if possible. The doctors tend to be um, more, um, uh, juries tend to like them better than big bad corporations. 
Um, another subject that was brought up was sort of how, you, Mr. Gallagher, you're talking more about how you have an advantage being not only in neurobiology, but also with the engineering background. And Dr. Rye was talking about how increasingly with the law, we have to have a better understanding of how machine learning works in order to adjust the laws. So do you think that in the new world that we live in with how increasingly prevalent technology is, that it should become more of a requirement for all different fields to have a strong background in these more computational fields? I'm very biased in that. My immediate <laughs> answer is yes. Um, I think I think that literacy in software, and in particular, sort of literacy in machine learning, um, is going to be very at least valuable, if not necessary, in the coming century. Um, how that works in terms of the education system and getting people access to, so so getting trained in software engineering in general, I think is a doable thing to make that literacy sort of a general thing that happens across the population. It won't be easy, but it's doable. Literacy in more advanced sort of machine learning techniques where you, it requires years of quantitative training in you know, different forms of calculus and statistics, um, I don't think that's practical for everyone, and I don't I don't know how to implement it, but I would love to see it happen. Uh, so I like that you said um, literacy because I think that should be the goal to make sure because it really is need to be a um, tiered approach here, right? Where I do think that especially um, physicians, nurses, um, social workers, you know, um, really everyone who works in healthcare uh, don't need to take for um, granted. Um, the information that is um, given uh, back to them, if it's in a, a you know um, electronic health record, and there's some type of, um, of you know maybe um, algorithm back there that is um, presenting some sort of real um, information back to them, I, I don't think we can expect people to really understand all of the um, computation that's going on. But at least to be able to make informed informed um, decisions to know what the what the um, limitations are, I do think will be very. Um, very, um, um, uh, that will be a very important thing here. So. And just to circle back to something that um, Mr. Gallagher said, I think that to the extent we um, want to avoid having this sort of anaphylactic reaction on the part of the public when something goes badly, um, that literacy is essential because they have to understand that this is the risk profile and you know and what that means uh, uh, because otherwise there is going to be exactly what Mr. Gallagher said that sense of well this is so much worse than taking the drunk driver out of the system and so just to close us out it seems fitting to just throw you all into deep water for a minute <laughs> um, so if you could each just talk about how you envision the future of artificial intelligence and medicine to be Not really, but I can take a, <laughs> can take a, uh, a stab at it. Um, so I, like I was saying before, I think it would be a, or I think it would be a boon um, to medicine to uh, adapt machine learning in all the cases where it's already proven that it can do a very good job, or at least as good as, you know, the population of doctors um, in individual well-defined tasks like um, diagnosing something based on images. Um, I think one area that is starting to be explored but could, should be explored more is compiling large amounts of complex data that doctors aren't used to looking at because it's just too much to deal with and getting more informed diagnoses and sort of, um, uh, I guess, treatment prescriptions based on that. So I think of the brain data sets that I work with. A doctor could never, I mean doctors can look at EEGs and say, oh I see like this doesn't look right, but I don't think they would ever be able to tell you exactly what it is that doesn't look right to like the precise degree that a machine learning algorithm could. So I'd love to see individual tasks that doctors might do replaced by those machine learning algorithms and then have doctors and sort of the medical field as a whole um, spend more time focusing on those human aspects and solving these other issues that we've talked about, such as privacy, such as integration, and getting, um, I mean, I think collecting large data sets in a safe way 
I don't know how to solve it, but that would be great for population health. So I agree with everything that Mr. Gallagher has said. I, um, I, I guess because by nature I'm older and maybe a little bit more of a pessimist, I do worry that I think in principle this could be a, a very bright future in terms of the, the role that machine learning could play in medicine. Um, whether that will occur in practice I think will depend upon a lot of things going right. And that includes not having catastrophic failures early on, so people get comfortable with the prospect of machine learning. Uh, not having um, fraudulent behavior, frankly, on the part of some of the purveyors, because not all human beings are angels. And so I think that um, the FDA does have an important role to play, and you know, the getting that balance right is really difficult. Um, so. So I think in principle, yes, for, I would agree with everything Mr. Gallagher has to say. In practice, I, I'm agnostic at this point. So I'm a um, optimist, um, <laughs> at least I um, wanna be. Uh, so how I at least hope um, AI will impact healthcare is that it will hopefully be able to make it more um, accurate, um, more, um, hopefully um, it'll be more, um, also um, accessible and um, efficient. And what I mean by this is when we think about um, health, it really is across your um, lifespan. And it's not, it's not a really in its current um, silo, um, a form where we think about a um, clinic or a um, hospital. And so what we hope will um, happen is we'll, we'll be able to get um, health data from um, people throughout many parts of their um, lives so that if say you have a you know um, cardiac, um, a, um, um, event, um, we don't necessarily um, recognize that when you come to the um, emergency department or you come to the um, doctor's office every, 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 every um, six months, but we recognize um, trends, we detect, we detect um, signals, and we're able to better um, filter people into the current um, system so that a um, physician can um, see people at hopefully um, the right time. Um, and um, and um, and um, hopefully be able to make better um, decisions in terms of what are the um, medications, what are the um, dosages that really um, people should be prescribed, and to um, hopefully begin to um, transition um, medicine and um, healthcare um, to be. Um, I, I don't want to say less of a of a um, art because it is in many ways a um, art, but just to be more um, be more um, accurate and um, efficient um, as well. Thank you guys so much. I believe we have a few more minutes. If there are any questions from the audience, okay. anyone in the back? I think that's absolutely right, and I think that that's, um, you know, part of what I think is, is interesting is I think that the FDA is very aware of this challenge, and one of the questions that arises then is whether that's something that they could do. For example, they have something that they're hoping to pilot called the pre-cert program, which essentially allows a continuous loop so that there is not a rigid distinction between pre-market and post-market. And so to be certified as um, a quality uh, developer of machine learning, it, it's supposed to be applicable to software generally, but to be certified as a quality developer of machine learning, I think one principle, and this is a, I hope they incorporate it ultimately once they get into the pilot stage and actually implement um, pre-certification, would be a commitment to um, responsible mechanisms for diversification of training data, either pre-market or post-market. I think in the end, um, AI is not going to solve a, um, a problem of not enrolling um, diverse um, patients into um, clinical trials. That that's a completely that's another um, topic. That's a 
that's um, something where we need to enroll um, diverse um, populations, and that's really um, that's a very um, important thing. Um, this is kind of related to the last question. Was that uh, especially like in epidemiology, where you're always getting studies coming out that are contra seem to contradict the prior <coughs> study? Do you see like a, a limitation with AI? Is that you can't get the right information from these studies? And how, how do you uh, address something like that? Because it's going to affect you know, uh, how you kind of look into the future and try to combat some of these abnormalities, physical maladies. Um, I'll, I'll take a quick stab at this. So I'm not, I'm not directly familiar with the, uh, the studies that you're mentioning, but I think more broadly, um, this is an issue in uh, science in general where you, it's not uncommon to get two studies that contradict each other. Um, and one of the causes of that is, I think, exactly what we've been talking about. You get different data sets or different populations or you're, you're collecting data from what you think should be a homogeneous population, even if it's, you know, it could be at the level of like different cell cultures and bacteria up to people. I think this happens at every level <coughs> where um, we're just not as aware as we need to be of how, you know, in one, one group might have collected data that actually isn't the same kind of thing that they're measuring as the other group. So that's maybe one area where we could start working on, but it, that it would be hard because you need better communication and you really need to get a better grasp of what you're actually collecting. My second response um, to that is that I think in tradi traditional um, statistics, you get you can often get um, scientists who aren't who are literate but not sort of well trained in the theory, doing um, things that they don't realize can lead to false conclusions. Um, the the primary one being something called p hacking, where um, you know if you um, run the same test on multiple populations over and over again, eventually you'll get the wrong answer that you're looking for. Um, and the, the it, it's an issue that the field deals with in general, but in machine learning, we sort of take an entirely different approach to um, concluding whether something works or not. And that's rather than taking our entire data set and sort of trying to come up with a conclusion based on that, you'll split it up and you'll have a training data set and then a held out data set where you'll sort of draw all of the conclusions that you can on your training data set and then on data that you've never seen before, you'll ask, do my conclusions still hold up? Um, and I think that's sort of a model that science in general might benefit from um, moving to. Um, I'll just add another thing is, I, I, I don't think it will ever um, change where we come out with new, you know, studies that make better conclusions. Um, one, because we are able to design better trials where you have better um, analytical tools. Um, and we also just don't always know what the long-term outcome is going to be from new drugs, new um, diagnostics, because um, health happens over time. And so it may be um, decades before we know um, some results. So there are many different um, factors involved there, but um, hopefully we'll, we will be come to get, we, we will get um, better conclusions. Um, and um, hopefully when there are different um, studies that do have different conclusions, that'll at least be a, it'll be um, a better than from um, the past um, when we um, I, I really appreciate the, the conversation, although I'm a little surprised that there's no uh, clinician or physician that's part of the panel want to talk about AI and medicine. <laughs> but I think for next year, there might be one area to, to look at. A question I had, well, they're, they're from a forward-looking perspective. One thing that I've seen in my experience in practice is that when there are changes, again, healthcare is a very complex field. It really is its own entity. And what can happen sometimes is that whenever you have different stakeholders with different agendas or different incentives or different interests, they don't necessarily align with those of others. And so one common challenge that we've encountered in medicine or that we see in other fields and other aspects of medicine as well is pushing towards things like cookbook medicine, for example. That's where you have the protocol, you blindly follow it instead of 
looking at the individual in the context of their specific needs and their health, and like we were talking about before, their social circumstances, their family dynamics, and all those other factors as well. And a part of that is because there is this dissonance between actual physicians and providing that medical care and those that pay for that care through insurance companies. And there's been a big push, this has been a trend over the last several years, at least five, 10 years, it's been more pronounced, to move towards just doing that kind of algorithm type approach. And it's getting back to my question for us in <laughs> context, but getting back to the question of, as we move forward, when we do get these adaptive, when we do get these new decision, uh, clinical decision support tools that hopefully are perfect and you know, assuming that that happens, which is the goal for everyone, what can be done to ensure that it doesn't just become the algorithm says it, therefore this is the right thing to do and you must never deviate from it. Because as it stands right now, insurance companies, for a lot of things, if you deviate from whatever the algorithm says, which is from a population perspective and you're trying to apply to an individual person, they simply won't pay for whatever testing or treatment is actually medically needed under the guise that it's not medically necessary because the guidelines are not paid for. Sorry, long-winded question, but it's really, what can you do to protect people that are actually needing care and receiving care from just being put into a single big box where everyone is considered the same? So I'll, I'll take it, that's a great question, and I'll take a, a short step at it. Not being a clinician, I, I can't say that I, I will have any particularly um, enlightening answers, but I think that, you know, it's a problem already, as you've indicated. So the question, I suppose, is will AI and machine learning make it worse? Because it seems that maybe the, the models are, are being presented as even more accurate and therefore insurance companies will see them as the gospel in a, in a way that's even more acute than they do now. Um, I mean, it's, I think it's certainly possible in the sense that, you know, the, the incentives of insurance companies are not necessarily aligned with the, the patients or anyone else necessarily. So, and I, I do think that, that there has to be, you know, a, education about the extent to which the models are necessarily going to be accurate on any specific patient. And so the, the ways that we, we have set up, the mechanisms we've set up to deal with insurance companies, perhaps this would be, a, a, the problems that we already see, this would be a, a fresh opportunity to try to improve um, on, upon the mechanisms. Um, but other than that, I, I can't say anything particularly enlightening, I'm afraid. Um, so I, thank you. Um, I, I personally think that going back to the literacy question that we were talking about before, I think that's a prerequisite um, to for any of these, so that for solving that problem with machine learning, is that at the very least the clinician needs to be literate in the model that he's using so that he can tell, or she can tell, that, oh, uh, I, I see what's going on here and it's making this decision because A, but really I think it's missing B. Um, that would be the ideal scenario, and that requires one getting um, good interpretable machine learning solutions in all of these cases, which I think is a very hard problem. And then again, two, um, making sure that the person using these methods is literate enough to kind of debug what how the algorithm is making the decision. Um, another thing that could be done that wouldn't be as great but would still help the problem a little bit is. Um, having the algorithm spit out its confidence level. So if the algorithm says, I'm 99% confident, then maybe it, then the insurance company can say, it was 99% confident, you should have listened. But if it was 50% confident, then the doctor should be able to say, no, like I think this was the wrong decision that it gave me and it said it wasn't sure, so I made my own decision. Um, thirdly, I think this is something that you don't need to do with machine learning algorithms, but in medicine in general, transparency with the patient. Um, I think is more important, and the patient should also be aware, and ideally be literate in why the decisions that are being made about them are being made. So I'll just add that um, um, a physicians were invited to be on the um, panel, but uh, the ones that were invited just weren't able to come. I am a clinician, I'm not a, I'm a physician. Um, 
So I think part of this really isn't a question about um, AI. It's really a, um, a policy thing. So as we build and design um, electronic health records, we really need to have um, physicians there when these systems are being built and we create um, interfaces for them for that um, point of care when you are hopefully using this tool to make better informed um, you know, um, a decisions. As you very well know, they're not currently designed that well. Uh, <laughs> And so, and that's really a failure of the um, system. So this is really more a policy um, question in the way in which we um, design care. So that's my question. I'll just add one point, which I think is is relevant, and that is that um, if the the algorithms that the FDA approves are going to not be particularly interpretable, which may happen then there's the possibility that you'll have a neural net running on top of the neural net trying to explain what the first neural net is doing. And whether that is something that we will want um, is, is an open question as well. So that's just a, uh, something to throw out there for future thought. Yeah, and I'll add that Duke Hospital is having its own AI conference right now, so that's why some of the physicians weren't necessarily available. But I think our panelists have done a really good job, so if you could all join me in thanking them for their time. And <laughs>